again, thank you, Marco, for the invitation. Uh, it's always great to connect with you and also, you know, the, the, the Psychedelic Society, the Research Association in Amsterdam. Um, as Marco says, most of my work has been around DMT and neuroimaging and maybe some psychological effects of DMT. Um, Throughout my, my PhD, I think um, I also became uh, one of the things that I, I did particular attention in, in studying was uh, phenomenology or how can we use phenomenology as a way to understand the DMT experience? Can, how can we anchor our knowledge of uh, the psychedelic experience uh, broadly on a disciplined approach to the study or understanding of experience, which is phenomenology. And I guess throughout that process in those, in those five years in which I did the PhD, I slowly developed an awareness and uh, also some red flags and concerns around the use of psychedelics and some ethical issues that were popping up here and there. And at the end of the, my PhD, I kind of formulated this under, under a single work Um, kind of like the outcome of this uh, as psychedelic apprenticeship. Um, the idea is that the psychedelic experience can be approached in a disciplined fashion and in a disciplined fashion, which is prim primordially embodied. It's, it's fundamentally experienced that, that this is the way that we can approach it. And we can also have a, uh, if you will, like a craftsmanship approach to the experience. So more than just manualizing a way that we can interact with the experience, which is, I, I think, the inertia in psychiatric, uh, common psychiatric and pharmacological approaches, we are threading a delicate space here with psychedelics in which embodied experience is at the forefront. Uh, and all these things hopefully will become clear as the talk progresses. Um, so I'd also like to just start by acknowledging um, my collaborators in this work. One is anthropologist uh, David Dupuy, uh, who did his field research in uh, Takiwasi specifically. And he conducted uh, all the interviews and all the ethnographic work uh, which supported uh, when I'm about to present, and also Rosalind Watts, who is the clinical lead, was the clinical lead from Imperial College Psilocybin for Depression, so the use of the component of magic mushrooms to treat depression that happened right now, which was recently published. Um, so she also provided uh, her input and, uh, and the example. And actually the, the process of this paper actually came about when I heard about one of her cases and I just wanted to write this paper. So for anybody interested, I, I wanna delve a bit more in detail about this talk. I suggest you, you go to Sci Archive and, and fetch the preprint of this publication. So to start off and in the context of um, bicycle day uh i just like i i guess i want to start from uh uh what have always felt uh, at a personal level what bicycle day symbolizes and what it means and for me it's this very disruptive event um in which by accident uh lsd was somehow invented some say discovered and that led to a series of downstream consequences um, one of them, of course, uh, is the introduction of LSD in psychiatry and research, but then we have this massive events in culture more widely, one of them uh, from psychedelic rock or psychedelic music in general uh, to Silicon Valley, not all of Silicon Valley, but certainly many aspects of it, and uh, the counterculture movement uh, more specifically. The counterculture, which still has a massive influence, not only on ideas, not only on technology, but I think in a big way on the aesthetics of the world that we perceive, the the coloring of everything, the you know the way that you know that this psychedelic experience has pervaded everything. 
And I call it a disruption because unlike uh, what would happen possibly, I mean, it's very hard to speculate how uh, this happens in indigenous traditions and indigenous contexts, but the use of psychedelic uh, associated plants in indigenous contexts has a more organic sort of evolution. It appears after possibly some form of trial or error or um, associated sort of developments that have like a gradual social expansion. Here in the case of LSD, we have an accidental invention that because it occurs in the context of science, it has a privileged sort of position to then infiltrate the rest of the culture. And it does so in a very fast and strong fashion. So I think that this gap has left, uh, uh, sorry, I think this disruption has left a form of gap in the current lineage around a practice which has a lot of delicate issues. And this is the psychedelic practice, is a space in which the experience of spirituality go very much hand in hand and which still has very much downstream effects, many of them very positive potentially. So for example, just to give again, a, 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 another form of context uh, at the cultural level, psychedelics uh, went on from being hallucinogens, a drug which induces hallucinations, uh, to psychedelics, a drug which manifests consciousness, and lately to a drug which can potentially transform or heal the mind, right? And these are narratives that have become prevalent throughout my lifetime in a very evident fashion, and I'm a fairly young person. So I think, again, we have a rapidly changing cultural landscape associated to the ingestion of these drugs. And how do we use them? And how do we make sense of them? What is this experience telling us? I think also broadly, this has to do with a form of re-enchantment with experience. I think fundamentally what psychedelics do is that they bring up salience to the nature of experience to some extent. They, 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 it, it shines a light on what experience can be about, I think. Um, so these transformative effects of psychedelics, scientific evidence is somehow stating that, you know, we can look at these transformative effects of the brain, or we can look at these transformative effects in the mind. So in the brain associated with neuroplasticity uh, and different mechanisms of neuronal neuroplasticity, as well as functional connectivity changes, which can last from one week to one month after the ingestion of psychedelics. And at the level of the mind, when we speak about transformative effects, usually we speak about uh, changes in personality traits, like, such as openness to experience, and um, the fact that you know many people rate these experiences as their most meaningful or the top five most meaningful in their lifetime, according to research in John Hopkins. And of course, this is just research. This is not taking into account the wealth of anecdotal um, information out there about the transformative effects of these substances. Um, so in mental health, we have uh, the work of, I think one of the most significant ones is the use of psilocybin to treat depression and how long lasting those changes can be. Depression being one of the most harrowing sort of conditions and more prevalent in these times. And recently, it just came out, this, uh, the trial of the use of psilocybin uh, versus acetalopram for the, for the treatment of depression. Uh, so the outcome of this essentially is that in terms of main outcomes, psilocybin has a similar sort of efficacious profile as your gold standard to treat depression, but without the common side effects. Now, if you look more in detail in the article, you'll find that actually for well-being and related measures, psilocybin is actually more effective. Nevertheless, this is a very important finding, uh, a form of a milestone, uh, I think, in psychedelic therapy, and maybe who knows, in, in medicine more broadly. Um, one of the, the mechanisms through which psychedelic therapy works is through precisely experience. Uh, this is the this is the basic tenant, or at least the hypothesis that many of us have, or at least where we have most of the information right now. 
And this experience uh, usually deals with novel information being provided during their experience. Uh, and that novel information can come in the form of novel insights, or it can come in the form of mystical type experiences. But we're always talking about some form of knowledge, right? So some, some form of um, experience in which more is happening. Something that wasn't there is now comes to the forefront. These insights can deal with autobiographical memories. Uh, it can deal with uh, truths regarding the nature of reality, the nature of humanity, the, or the nature of relationships. And the idea is that these insights can have therapeutic value as long as they are held within a specific context. So this speaks again about the crucial role that experience has for these transformative effects. Right now, there is an interesting discussion actually on whether or not the subjective effects are really necessary for psychedelics to have some form of transformative or clinical effect associated to them. This is the position of uh, Yaden and Griffiths in this article that they recently published and the contrary opinion, uh, position taken by Olson who says that no, it's possible to develop a psychedelic compound or a compound that acts on the specific receptors in the brain which are linked to psychedelic activity, but which does not induce subjective effects. And they would still induce the neural plasticity or these effects in the brain uh, required for these transformative effects to take place. Now I'm gonna uh, take into account the more popular opinion for this specific presentation in saying that subjective effects are actually fundamental for clinical outcomes uh, to bear some relevance. So if that's the case, and if we take experience as the mechanism for healing transformation clinical outcomes, then we have to take this experience in a very serious fashion. That's uh, my approach to it, right? Um, so lived experience is where we start from and we're almost linked back. It's like a guiding thread. And if you will, from a phenomenological perspective, uh, one can think of the psychedelic experience as a form of break, a parenthesis, or a discontinuity in everyday experience, in which our givenness of the world or our natural attitude, as it would be said, of what reality is, is now put into parenthesis, is put into question. We are having a form of hallucination, imagery about what's out there. We can have a revelation about the nature of reality, for example. Or we can have a simple visual distortion about the environment. All of this talks about a disruption of our normal way of experiencing. And in this disruption, something novel emerges, something new emerges. It can be a form of a vision, it can come in the form of an insight, or it can come in the form of a revelation. But always we are speaking about a creative act or a creative capacity that we have as human beings. As you know, The idea is, is that psychedelics would somehow engage this creative process that we have as human beings. And this is going to be the focus of one that I'm going to try to talk about um, this evening. In this parenthesis, a common experience is um, the one of having psychedelic insights. Now, these psychedelic insights can have a noetic quality to them. So they may feel as true and unmediated. So what is meant by this? So for this, we can go to William James and what he writes of noetic experiences in the varieties of mystical experiences. So he mentions, although similar to states of feeling, mystical states seems to those who experience them to be also states of knowledge. They are states of insight into the depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate though they remained, and as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority for after time. So the idea is that these noetic states, um, they come as without a form of mediation. They usually, they also can come without 
a form of narrative or discursive intellect. And because they don't have this capacity, they feel as unmediated. And because they are unmediated, they come, they carry a form of authority. Uh, that means they can have a potential transformative capacity, right? Uh, I also recommend for people who are interested in this noetic quality to look into um, Benny Shannon's book, uh, The Antipodes of the Mind, who's a phenomenological inquiry into the ayahuasca experience. And he delves very much deeply into this, uh, this noetic experience induced by ayahuasca and the impact that it has, um, and all from a first person. So it's a, a very rich in terms of phenomenological content. The first hypothesis that we outline in, the, in our paper is that this noetic quality does not pervade just mystical type content, but also relates to autobiographical uh, and creative revelations and ideas. So the idea would be that this is a high experience that comes in psychedelic states. Do not just concern mystical states, but concerns a wide range of different contents. So what is the nature or how can we understand these psychedelic insights? So here we have three examples. I got a wide perspective. I stepped back. This helped me appreciate that the world is a big place. There's a lot more going on than just the minor things that were going on in my head. I had an encounter with a being with a strong feeling that that was myself telling me it's all right. I don't need to be sorry for all the things I've done. I had an experience of tenderness towards myself. During that experience, there was a feeling of true compassion I had never felt before. I think to accept that people love me, that yeah, that I'm worthy of being loved. So these are all insights of different kinds appearing in accounts of psychedelic therapy sessions. So these are all taken from narratives of participants undergoing psychedelic trials. Now, we can think of psychedelic insights of being unmediated, but if we are being neuroscientific about it, we can also try to put some form of mediation at the level of the brain. So where are these coming from? So according to the Rebus model by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston, they postulate that the origin of insights is somehow related to the disinhibition of limbic structures in the brain. Uh, so to provide a, a very broad overview of this, the idea would be that the brain is always channeling some form of modeling of the world. So our perception, our experience of the world is really our experience of our models. And the little corrections of these models from time to time, but essentially the models would prevail. Our predictions about what's going on, they prevail our experience. So here you see models in red you know, or their prevalence and novel information somehow being a secondary, simply a corrective sort of movement uh, operating at the level of the brain. Under psychedelics, the novel information would take a central role and the models would be, would be taking a more secondary role. And the novel information would be coming from these limbic areas, these more ancient brain structures um, that harbor memories, emotions, and so on. So this would also speak to the ability of psychedelics of somehow um, providing access to traumatic experiences. Um, the idea would be that these traumatic experiences uh, are somehow being uh, blunted, compressed, or somehow put to the side because our models, our way of coping with the world through our models, says this is not the time to deal with this so we'll, we'll keep it to the side psychedelics would relax the influence of these models and allow these um this information to be to come forward and that can have a therapeutic sort of quality so here we're speaking about an insight the arrival of information which can be somehow associated to these brain processes so this is the same idea we have predictions, which are the models of the world. And then we have prediction errors, which are the corrections to these models. Uh, in normal state, the predictions pervade our conscious experience. Under psychedelic state, these prediction errors, bottom-up information 
would now take a more central role because these models are reduced. The filters are being put to rest. And we've actually seen some evidence for that in some of our later papers with uh, DMT, in which we, we see this through uh, propagating waves in the brain, the influence of forward versus backward uh, brain waves. Um, so there's a reduction of backward predictive processes of these filters. The influence of these filters is reduced and forward novel information now takes a more central role. So the idea is that psychedelics reduce the influence of predictive models of the brain, allowing novel information to come up into our field of experience. And yes. What's another way that we can think about mediation? Another way that we can think about mediation is through context, set and setting, for example, right? So the other uh, hypothesis that we put forward in this paper is that although these noetic effects, uh, these insights that come about in the psychedelic experience, although they feel as unmediated, as direct, mediation mechanisms is always at play. And uh, a very obvious example, and an example that I think most of the psychedelic research community agrees, and not just the psychedelic research community, I would say the psychedelic community at large, is the importance of set setting and cultural context more widely, right? Uh, so we devise this little diagram and we say that we can always have opportunities to mediate and validate a specific psychedelic insight by operating at different scales. So at the, at the smaller scale, we have the acute psychedelic experience and there's always some form of mediation happening there. You can think of the, the work that a therapist does and the way that they are trying to foster people, for example, to get closer to the painful traumatic event, the painful emotion. That is a way of mediating the apparition of that insight or that context. Then we have immediate past events, immediate future events. So we can think of preparation and integration. We can think of past lifespan events and future lifespan events. So all the autobiographical information and the way that it plays an important role in that psychedelic experience. The obvious thing is memories, but not just memories. You can also think the historical emotional development of that person and how it builds up into some form of expression during that psychedelic experience. And finally, the cultural context in which uh, the experience is embedded in. So past social cultural events and future social cultural events, a person having a very strong trip uh, at the beginning of the 1960s could be certainly aware or you know, thinking that they're hallucinating very strongly and maybe having a psychotic break depending on the context in which they're having it. A person in our times is voluntarily having a psychedelic experience probably to achieve what they've read about a mystical experience. So culture matters. There's always all these uh, levels of mediation and validation of an experience of these insights at different temporal and spatial scales. Another important aspect, I think, uh, and again, this is uh, um, uh, uh, kind of like a contrarian view on, 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 on maybe even the relevance or the spiritual significance of these inst of insights. But another important aspect is that feelings of insight uh, may increase the attribution of truth to certain statements. Uh, feelings of insights help us make quick decisions. They have an evolutionary role. Um, and importantly, these feelings of insights can be experimentally induced. You can, you can somehow trick a person into having an, a high experience. Uh, I really like this, this paper by Ruben Laukonen, uh, who's now a collaborator actually, um, into precisely how these, uh, what is the nature of these aha moments? And I think the open question is, uh, are able, are psychedelics really able to increase insight phenomenology regardless of the content associated to that insight? So are somehow psychedelics increasing the, the tone of insight, right? Your, your, your potential to have an insight sort of aha moment 
regardless of any sort of content that you're having? And if that is the case, what are the ethical implications of that? So that's the, um, that's the work of Ruben. And I, I, I suggest you, you take a look because it's really insightful uh, experiences. And the third hypothesis that we, we set up in this paper is that it is the same mechanism which drive therapeutic benefits in a psychedelic sessions, which may also drive undesirable complications or iatrogenic uh, complications in a medical context. In this way, psychedelic insights may act as a double-edged sword. So this is uh, essentially um, work by the Hopkins team in which they saw, which they see that both acute mystical effects and acute insight effects uh, leads to increases in psychological flexibility, which in turn uh, influences decreases in depression and um, anxiety. So we have these positive effects of insight. Now, what are some of the negative or some of the ethical consequences associated to having these uh, increased tone of insight in psychedelic experiences? So the first context, I'm going to show a series of examples in which we try to outline and make the case of these ethical complications and why we need a form of psychedelic apprenticeship. So this occurs in um, the context of a psilocybin session in a clinical trial. You can actually uh, take a very good look at this process because one of the the characters in this is the protagonist of this movie uh, called Magic Medicine. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, so the session, uh, the, the psilocybin session uh, induced content uh, for the participant in which the participant confronted a cruel creature uh, which he took to represent a repressed memory of his mother trying to smother him when he was a baby, right? So he recalls things like, oh, I'm experiencing my mom and it's putting a pillow over me. Uh, and then there's this whole emotional struggle and reaction to it of, of how difficult, or, you know, how could it be that my mother tried to smother him? Uh, throughout the, the accounts of this participant, the verbal accounts and the interviews and so on, um, he goes on and on about how, you know, the challenges in trying to make sense of this uncovered memory, this, this autobiographical insight, this novel information that just came out of the blue during the psychedelic therapy session. And you can actually see this in the movie in, in, a, in, in a very explicit fashion. Uh, so after the session, the participant tries to make sense of what happened. So he mentions, it's about trying to move on. It's all very well people saying, this is, was just a symbolic event, but I don't think it is. When it happened, it felt more real than real, than the here and now. I do think that something must have happened, something pretty severe in my childhood for this treatment to take me back there. But what do you do with it? Do you just deal with it? So this very, this ongoing struggle of trying to determine whether or not this experience of insight, this apparent reliving of autobiographical information, was it symbolic or was it completely real? So that's the, that's the struggle the participant goes through. And then, you know, throughout the movie uh, and, and in, this, you know, in this particular context, you, you can actually see the way that there's a form of mediation happening, social mediation through the process of integration. So the participant is then uh, derived to an integration therapist. And with the integration therapist, he somehow makes sense of this. Uh, so he mentions the information that was revealed to me was so new and quite useful. You need to make sense of it though. Integration for me is as important as set and setting. It's important getting to the point of having revelations. Uh, regarding of whether it's true or not, that information needs to be understood by your consciousness. It's going to be rattling around. Did it happen? Didn't it happen? And that's not the point at all. This message has come along. So what does it mean? So in a way, he takes a more nuanced view on, on what this biographical revelation was all about and what did, what did it actually mean to him. So this is the first example. This is the context of psychedelic therapy. The second example concerns um, 
experiences in a neo-shamanic retreat center. So this is based on the work of David Dupuy, his ethnographic uh, work in the, in the Peruvian Amazon. So in this specific retreat center, uh, we're putting it forward as a heavily mediated uh, instance, um, possibly an instance in which the contents are, are somehow proposed and that having a potential ethical quality to it. So visitors to this retreat center attend two week retreats for purposes of personal development. So they go through introductory lectures, ritual activities, ingestion of ayahuasca and other purgative plants, and also post-session discussions. So there's, you have a wide range of devices in place around the psychedelic experience or the ayahuasca experience if you wanna be, uh, if you wanna have the broader view of, of ayahuasca. So in this, participants are presented to the specific cosmovision of the center. The specific cosmovision of the specific center it combines neo-shamanic elements, psychotherapeutic elements, some bioethical, some biomedical elements, and also elements of folk Catholicism. So it's an intriguing cosmovision which both Catholicism and neo-shamanic sort of like spirits and beings are part of it. The important part here is that the framing of psychological suffering, you know, the reason why many participants attend this retreat, uh, is uh, put forward as a form of demonic influence or possession. Uh, so the idea is that, for example, um, if you're feeling extremely depressed or if uh, you're going through some form of grievance uh, that is hard to really you know, get through, this is proposed, uh, this is somehow framed by the retreat center as uh, a sort of spirit which is inhabiting your body, which needs to be dealt with. Um, so these are some of the examples here. Uh, there were all the demons parasiting me. So these are ayahuasca experiences in this context. There were all these demons parasiting me inside, but I saw the ayahuasca that was chasing them. Like a lot of little bright snakes inside my body that were circulating and cleaning all that up. Later I saw ayahuasca. She was a kind of woman with a snake like lower body showing me how the demons got in, what I had done, and therefore what I had to do to stop them from entering. So this narrative of, of infestation or possession very much um, clear in this example. Another example, at one point I had a vision with the archangel St. Michael, who's piercing a demon with his sword, as in the religious images. Later, I felt the presence of Christ who looked behind my back where chains were hung connected to a cage. I saw my demons laughing because I had to drag my cage to move forward in life. They jerked me around all the time, like they were raping me. When Christ saw the chains and the cage, he said it had nothing to do here and kicked it all out. So elements of the Christian pantheon and how these um, yeah, essentially all these evil, like evil or undesirable beings are inhabiting uh, the person and are, are part of that, you know, are, are part of the psychological issues that people are trying to attend with. In the, in the work of David Dupuy, he, he mentions how these intersubjective instances so everything that is happening around the ayahuasca experiences, these group discussions, the cleaning practices that are the purgative sort of like practices that are all like proposed by the center. These are all practices that serve some form of mediation uh, in which participants reframe psychological or somatic issues as forms of demonic possession. And the result is what he calls a process of socialization of hallucinations. Now, I don't have a specific sort of opinion on hallucinations or truths or whatever, but the idea would be that there is an influence of context happening here. Apologies, my cap. Okay, yeah. um, there is a process of intersubjective mediation embodied here more uh, evidently in the group discussions, which not only shapes 
the way that people make sense of it, but the hypothesis of Dupuy is that it actually shapes the phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience. So the contents appearing during a session are central, are being directly influenced by these contextual mechanisms. So forms of intersubjective mediation. So during these discussions groups, it is frequently suggested to participants by fellow participants and ritual specialists or facilitators that some aspect of their experience reveal the presence of demonic entities, which provide this infestation diagnosis, or benevolent agents, nature spirits, Catholic pantheon beings. Group discussions serve here as practices of mediation in which participants reframe psychological or somatic issues by adopting specific cultural motives of possession which are then experienced during subsequent ayahuasca sessions. So we have an iterative process in which you have retreats in which ayahuasca is not only ingested once, but many times. And we have group discussions interspeeded with this ayahuasca sessions. And we have this back and forth in which people are going in and out of ayahuasca experiences and are having these group discussions, which are also helping to reframe them and also influence the ayahuasca experience itself. Now, the external, externalization of mental health issues, for example, in this case, in the form of possession, may have therapeutic value. So what we're trying to do with this is not put a judgment on um, the therapeutic eff efficacy of what is going on. But however, uh, some of the participants interviewed by David mentioned that uh, they also serve as a tool of conversion uh, for some into a cosmology, which may not be fully consented. Uh, so many of these participants come from a very secular France uh, and they, um, they go to Peru, they have their experiences, they become acquainted with the cosmology, which then in the flesh, they live the cosmology. And then they take some of these cleansing practices and some of these Catholic rituals back into France. Uh, and some of them uh, report a level of distress associated to that. So here we have, uh, again, the idea of a double-edged sword, the same mechanism, which provides some form of therapeutic efficacy or therapeutic value, is also potentially allowing some form of conversion. The third context, uh, this is more closely related to my uh, experience as a psychedelic uh, scientist, researcher, or whatever you want to call it, a scientist who deals with uh, or who tries to use psychedelics as a way to try to probe into the human mind or into the human brain. How can we use psychedelics to try to understand human consciousness? So let's uh, look into this DMT experience or the report of a subject on a DMT experience. I felt the presence of this alien substance, this green gooey alien substance, which is not organic. Everything is silicon based stuff which once was gooey but now is fossilized this fossilized gooey stuff is what reality is the forests you see on planet earth that's a beautiful simulation these are humans there are humans on these shelves in very tight spaces and that's how i felt this very very compressed space so finally i felt i got to know what was in that forest Every human body is just one shelf and there is another human on another shelf. And this is the nature of reality. The reason why we're not suffering is because machines are generating this beautiful reality for us. So kind of like tapping into this uh, reality is a simulation meme uh, that became uh, fairly popular some years ago with, you know, uh, Elon Musk and so on, but not an uncommon um, uh, kind of like report that pops it uh, pops up here and here and there regarding the MT experiences. Now the concern is how how much can we trust this experience uh, or the reporting of this experience as a valid first person report? I'm a scientist. I am trying to understand what are the effects of psychedelics in the human mind and link those effects in the human mind with brain activity. So how can we actually validate this report? Because psychedelics have an ineffable quality to them, it's hard to put into words these experiences. And because 
DMT, for example, affects uh, memory in a very specific fashion, we're presented here with um, a challenge. Uh, how can we validate this information? We're trying to understand the, the effects in the, in the brain. That's the third context, psychedelic science. Then we have another context. This is um, work uh, that we've done in naturalistic research. Uh, throughout my experience interviewing a lot of people who had taken DMT and and going back and forth with them and you know like and also tapping into this DMT culture I was uh, really amazed by this idea that psychedelics and very immersive psychedelic experiences can actually change the, your views concerning the nature of realities or worldviews. Because of that, we developed a questionnaire with several sort of like philosophical positions about what is the nature of reality. Uh, this is very important, not just because our individual views concerning the nature of reality bear some form of relevance to us, but also because several institutions uh, from politics to religions to law are based on specific um, metaphysical views uh, or views concerning the nature of reality. So we devised this, this questionnaire um, uh, and in that we put formulations of, for example, the idea that there, ex there exists separate realms or dimensions beyond this physical world. Visiting such immersive uh, worlds depends on a magical transition or a supernatural event. Uh, the universe obeys a unifying principle beyond any material or scientific explanation. The primary form of reality is material. The primary form of reality is uh, ideal uh, or the primary form is dual. Uh, so you have a non-material and a material sides of the world. So all of these uh, postulates we put in a questionnaire and we really wanted to assess this. We really wanted to get some data on it because it's so commonly reported, but there's not any sort of data on it. So we wanted to investigate this idea of the ontological shock, right? This idea that they, they induce this transformation of the nature of reality and that has an effective impact on the person. And uh, our data actually shows that psychedelics increase endorsement for anti-physicalist beliefs for at least six months post the session. So we have a long lasting transformation concerning the nature of reality away from a physicalist view. The idea that the nature of reality is fundamentally physical. This is a prevailing view on that many scientists have, not all of them, um, regardless of whether or not it's correct. Um, and not only that, and this was a single, by the way, a single experience induced these changes for over six months, but we also saw that lifetime psychedelic use correlated with this endorsement of non-physicalist beliefs. So the more psychedelic use a person reported, this, the more likely they were to endorse a move away from physicalism. And importantly, we found that non-physicalist beliefs, changes in these beliefs correlated with increases in well-being. And at the same time, in scores of spiritual bypassing. Uh, spiritual bypassing is um, thought of as a overly, uh, an over-focus on spiritual matters after these experiences usually. Um, in detriment of working on personal issues or, or personal relations, a form of dissociation, some people mentioned. So changes in non-physicalist beliefs are associated, are associated to both increases in well-being and spiritual bypassing. Again, we have this ethical tension, the idea that psychedelics are somehow a form of, or are used or can be used as a double-edged sword, right? And, and this is just to put, provide more data on this for those interested. So we found that 44% of materialists uh, turned into having no preference. So here you see the materialists and there you go. So 44% of them went from a strong materialist position into an agnostic position. 
28% of agnostics turn into dualists. So they believe that mind and matter are completely different realms of reality. And 55% of agnostic panpsychists then uh, convert into believers. They, they now have hold a panpsychist position. So very, very intriguing uh, results. And lifetime uses of psychedelics positively correlates with panpsychist views and negatively correlates with physicalist uh, views or materialist views. So again, this, this idea that in, in psychedelics have the impact of changing views concerning the nature of reality and can induce conversion in certain regards. So also kind of close to this notion of um, cult practices or cult-like issues. Um, so again, the same mechanism driving therapeutic improvements may also drive changes in beliefs. And we also postulate that ontolo this ontological shock effect is the one that may lead to these changes in beliefs. And we also found in this study that these changes in beliefs are influenced by both baseline aspects of the person, so trait personality characteristics like trait absorption, gender, age, and uh, acute effects during the psychedelic session. So how much people felt an emotional synchrony with other participants. This happened in retreats, psychedelic retreats and group sessions. And this effect in changes in beliefs was moderated by baseline levels of peer conformity. So we're talking about social psychological variables mediating these changes in beliefs, possibly mediating these noetic effects again. So although the noetic quality might feel, again, true and unmediated, uh, I think we have sufficient evidence to say that a strong sense of mediation is happening. Now, at what level, that is not entirely clear. So we outlined this in terms of at different timescales, but at the broader sort of cultural level, we can think of psychedelic experiences as being mediated and embedded in larger historical and cultural contexts. Each of them have their own agendas. So psychedelic research, for example, uh, favors an experimental per perturbation of consciousness and foster a mechanistic understanding of consciousness, where psychedelic therapy fosters the enhancement of individual well-being and a biographical understanding of mental illness. However, there's an ethical tensions between in psychedelic therapy and psychedelic research in the sense that psychedelic therapy fosters well-being, which might be in tension with psychedelic research of giving drugs of people, for example, in a scanner, which might induce not optimal sort of effects. They can be safe, but they can be described as unpleasant as well. Importantly, for example, neo-shamanism at times can foster an animistic or supernatural understanding of consciousness, which is in contradiction with a mechanistic understanding of consciousness as postulated by psychedelic research. At the same time, neo-shamanism may foster an animistic or supernatural understanding of mental illness, which might be in tension with a biographical understanding of mental illness. Now, again, I don't, uh, I'm not interested, and we're not interested to favor any of these positions or these contexts over the other while being aware that we do occupy some of these places. Um, but we wish to outline important commonalities and important ethical tensions just to, in a way, highlight the playing field, what's, what's happening in this negotiation of different interests uh, which are being played out in these contexts. This is the level of mediation that we're speaking about. So how can we deal with this? How can we try to cope with this? Uh, if we think of the, of the repercussions of this, if we think of the fact that we're outlining specific examples here and there of some tensions, ethical concerns that are associated to the psychedelic insights, 
uh, associated to this noetic quality, this double-edged sword associated with psychedelic experience. In this paper, we, we propose a, a coping framework. We, we outline based on, on literature, uh, how can we possibly deal with this? This is what we call psychedelic apprenticeship. The idea is that in this framework, uh, and by the way, this framework is outlined, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's called On Becoming Aware um, by philosopher Natalie Dupra. Um, the neurobiologists, uh, philosopher and mathematician Francisco Arella and the psychologist Pierre Vermesh. Um, in, uh, in this work, very influenced by the phenomenological tradition, uh, they postulate that the act of becoming aware of having these insights is a human act that is so basic that it is independent of the context in which it occurs. So how can we have a disciplined view on the process of insight? So they mentioned the reflecting act in psychology, the act of reduction in phenomenology, and the mindfulness, uh, mindful, the act of mindfulness in, in Buddhist meditation tradition. These are all acts of becoming aware. These are all methods on how do we become aware, how do we mediate, how do we validate these insights in an intersubjective fashion in three different contexts. The idea is that whenever the tradition is strong enough, a lineage is developed in which this act of becoming aware follows the same structure. So what is that structure? Well, not there yet. Uh, before then, uh, the act of becoming aware is tricky. Uh, it requires an apprenticeship. So the outline, introspection is difficult. It demands an apprenticeship. It requires progressive development of a genuine expertise. The greatest difficulty lies in the fact that this technicality is masked, that it can pass unnoticed due to the apparent ease about our states of mind or thought process or emotion. So the idea is that the study of experience, the inquiry into experience is not a given. Although we have this natural attitude in which we have a taken for grantedness about even our own experience, our emotions, our thought process, in reality is a highly challenging endeavor. This is why the lineage of meditation uh, exists for thousands of years. It's all about cultivating a practice, cultivating an intersubjective um, scenario in which this inquiry is fostered in the best way possible. So what are the constituents of becoming aware? They outline three things. The first one is the basic cycle. The idea is that whenever we become aware, the first act that is required is suspension. We suspend our realist prejudice that what appears to you is the truly the state of the world. This is followed by a redirection. You redirect your attention from the exterior to the interior processing. And finally, the letting go in which you let go or accept the experience that you're having. And this is a cycle. It means that any act of becoming aware follows this progression from suspension to redirection to letting go. And then once that experience of insight that comes from this comes, then we go back into the cycle in which we suspend our naive attitude about the contents that we're experiencing. We redirect our attention and then we're able to let go and accept the experience over and over again. This would be the basic cycle of a disciplined approach to an experience, any, any form of experience in which we become aware of some form of content. In this case, we're interested in insights. What is the second? The intuitive act. So we have the basic cycle, which we just outlined. We have intuition and we have a circulation between the basic cycle and, intuit and intuition itself. This intuitive moment as understood in this framework 
is an immediate and direct giving of evidence which hits like a lightning bolt. It has a cognitive and an affective dimension. Cognitively, it feels like an aha or an eureka moment. And effectively, it feels like a sudden feeling of profound justice or quasi aesthetic success. And it's accompanied by emotion, by joy or jubilation at times. We can think of aha moments in psychedelic experiences in the same way, right? Again, the circulation in which we first suspend, we redirect attention, we let go into the contents of the experience. And this is then filled in, like, you know, in the experience of a lightning bolt with, with this sort of aha moment. And the third, sorry, the number is wrong. The third part, uh, fundamental to aid in a disciplined process of becoming aware is the process of validation. Now, how can we think of validation? I can validate my experience in a first person perspective, which would be an intuitive mode of validating my experience just by intuition. I have the experience, I validate it as truth. I relieve the experience of this traumatic memory. I have the intuitive fulfillment and therefore it is now certain. I will now structure my actions based on this. That is a, according to the authors, a solipsistic way of validating information. Why is it solipsistic? Because it's singular. It's not put in any sort of intersubjective fashion. At the other extreme of validating information, validating these insights, we have a reductionist approach. What would be a reductionist approach in its extreme sort of conceptualization would be the process of science in which we take your experience okay, you had an amazing experience in which you re-experienced the trauma and resolved it. I don't care about that. I just look at the brain process underlying that experience and I reduce it to these neural correlates and your experience, the content of it has no significance at all. All that we care is about the neuroplasticity behind this. And then between them, we have a second person approach. And this is the position of empathetic, empathic resonance. This is the one that we are interested. This is the optimal uh, sort of position which is uh, put forward in this framework. And this is where the role of a good facilitator, a good guide, a good therapist, or a good researcher has uh, when we're dealing with these experiences of insights and also these experiences of insight in a psychedelic session. How does this play out? How does this second person approach play out? This second person approach is rooted on notions of ethical and embodied know-how. Uh, again, it's, so it deals with the embodied experience of experiencers, guys, and the broader community. It is an intersubjective discipline approach to the study and mediation of therapeutic experience based on empathic resonance. It is a disciplined approach to mediate that first person intuitive experience. And it can be fostered through advanced phenomenological interviewing techniques such as microphenomenology. Um, another good example could be the accept, connect, and body approach uh, put forward by Rosalind Watts and Jason Loma. So you can look at that paper as well in which they outline the way in which uh, these psychedelic experiences can be framed under this framework. Um, and a broad awareness of the different therapeutic devices which can occur during a psychedelic session. And more broadly, the idea is that psychedelic therapy is embedded within a much larger process. And ultimately, the idea is the development of know-how involving experiencer, facilitator, and the wider community. So, Let's look at each of these individually. So for example, in this role, in this framework of psychedelic apprenticeship, the experiencer is affected by uh, these different variables that we were outlining before. So psychedelic knowing occurs only via intuition, noetic experiences, experiences of insight, acute psychedelic experiences, the surrounding events, uh, and biographical and historical cultural knowledge. When we have a second person approach of empathic resonance, we have the intersubjective mediation, validation, 
of a therapist, facilitator, and researcher. We're talking about a person who has gone through the process of experience that the experiencer is having, knows the benefits, knows the pitfalls, has lived it in the flesh, and therefore is qualified, is able to guide the participant through that process. He has undergone a similar process as the experiencer. I can provide gradual orientation to the process of becoming aware, of handling these insights in the best way possible. What are some of the devices that uh, a good facilitator can do? These are just examples. Uh, so from using the setting, uh, knowing how to manage music and specific therapeutic interventions during an acute psychedelic experience, managing preparation integration the best way possible, providing a uh, proper phenomenological inquiry, uh, fostering psychotherapy or personal development, managing beliefs, attitudes, and prejudice. Now, this doesn't believe that, sorry, this doesn't entail necessarily that, uh, you know, a second person approach entails that the same person is doing all these things, but that, that it is a position uh, embodied by a person who has undergone that process or many different people undergoing that process. And that such orientation eventually facilitates acts of becoming aware on both the experiencer and also the guide in the form of learning. The idea is that a good guide has enough practice to also perfect his uh, guiding practice, researcher practice, or facilitator practice. And the idea is that in wider and temporal and spatial scale, this recursive process of learning involving experiences and facilitators can also provide the wider community of psychedelic experiences for facilitators and researchers instances to develop knowledge or know-how regarding psychedelic experiences and therapeutic processes uh, more widely. And this is what we speak about when we think about the development of the lineage, this gap that we have in Western culture in which you know, we had the advent of psychedelic experiences and psychedelic use of such a broad upscale and in such a short period of time uh, that we don't have these cultural, or we have them, but we there, there's more to be done with the development of lineage. And we can think of these different temporalities of becoming aware also at these different scales. So psychonautics may occur at this basic cycle and the level of intuition mostly, uh, the level of therapy and integration, we have mechanisms of social expression and validation of insights. And at the level of lineage, we have historical and cultural transmission. Um, so what are examples of lineage? Uh, lineages can come from indigenous tradition, psychedelic therapy. Uh, these are all things that are being cultivated and have been cultivated already in terms of psychedelic lineage. This is know-how, which is rich source of information. Psychedelic science is providing a form for people to frame their experiences. Um, it's interesting to hear for me, uh, so many people speaking about that they want to deactivate the default mode network uh, through a psychedelic experience that, that can somehow liberate their mind. This provides a roadmap. This, this is a form of lineage as well. Um, we can perfect these narratives and we can perfect them to bridge them closer to experience. We have holotropic breathwork and other related practices that aid in this development of know-how and this development of lineage. The role of integration circles, which I find is crucial, not only because they provide a space for people to to share their experiences, but it is a bottom-up organic process um, in which this sort of act of becoming aware is being socially and intersubjectively mediated, it's being shared, uh, and the role of community is absolutely central in that. And uh, of course, uh, festivals. Um, one could argue that places where psychedelics are used or, or more broadly have have developed their own form of lineages or for own form of know-how uh, with different ranges of formality but the idea is that i mean one example that always comes to mind is that for example 
uh, people ha have learned very well how to dose themselves on LSD usually. Uh, so uh, although psychedelic use can have risks in, 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 you know, in recreational, what you might call recreational use, um, at the same time, people have learned to manage uh, and learn how to manage context set and setting in optimal ways to reduce those. Um, and yeah, this is why I speak about psychedelic culture more largely. So we can also think of festivals and instances such as cosmic care or psych care or harm reduction practices. All of them go into this idea of building a psychedelic know-how or building a psychedelic image. So to conclude, the idea is that we're trying to cultivate, or at least that's the ideal, uh, these things are, are building up to the cultivation of a psychedelic ethical know-how. Ethical action is the result of an embodied practice more than the manualization of procedures. The idea is that it is in the experience where these epistemological or insight related challenges will occur and it is in the progressive engagement with the process of experience that the subject will eventually learn to navigate the subtleties of the psychedelic space. We argue that the process is recursive and can be aided by contextual devices and intersubjective practices. Forms of psychedelic apprenticeship are required to be grounded on experiential forms of know-how, which foster the development of devices that allow recursive forms of experiential inquiry. And this is especially relevant considering the increasing demand for psychedelic therapy and the exponential increase in interest associated with psychedelics in current times more broadly. So the question of the beginning is, are psychedelics transformative? Uh, and the answer is that, well, we don't know. It, it may be that psychedelics reveal uh, that there is no true self uh, or that the self is merely a construction something in resonant with certain Buddhist traditions, and even with modern cognitive neuroscience, some theories in modern cognitive neuroscience. However, it is important to find an adequate and sustained practice to cultivate that, to embody it in the flesh. So to end, uh, talk alone will certainly not suffice to engender spontaneous non-ecocentric concerns in ethically developed persons. Even more than experiences of insight, words and concepts can easily be grasped at, taken as ground, and woven into a clock of egohood. Teachers in all contemplative traditions warn against taking fixed views and concepts as reality. We simply cannot overlook the need for some form of sustained practice or practique the transformation de sujet. And this is the paper. I encourage, uh, if you're interested in delving a bit more in detail, to check this out and uh, that's it for me thank you for your attention and uh, your patience in this uh, in this kind of unusual talking